everybody, and welcome back to AWS What's Next. We have a very special episode for you today. I know every episode is special in its own way, Rob. Um, but before we get into the details of, of why folks have a lot to look forward to, uh, why don't we tell everyone a little bit about the show? Because I know there's probably some viewers tuning in who may not be familiar with us. Yeah, hey everyone. Welcome one, welcome all. This is What's Next, the AWS live show where we cover the latest launches. And the key thing about this show is that it's live and we have guests on this, the show where we ask them questions, you can ask them questions in chat, and we get to see really cool demos. Yeah, I mean, you said it better than I could, and I'll, I'll just double down on some of those things. This is live. You know, when we talk about news at AWS, you know, myself and, and Rob, too, included, like, there's lots of ways to consume things like blog posts and, and videos that are already published elsewhere. But we know for a fact that some of you have questions of how to do X, Y, and Z things. Or maybe you're curious, like, hey, is this a, a good fit for, you know, a particular workload that I have? Um, and, and that's the value here, right? You've got two eager hosts on screen here, myself and Rob. We're going to be joined by guests, and we are happy to forward any of those questions along. Uh, and then we're also going to be having some subject matter experts hanging out in chat, waiting in the wings to answer any questions that you may have. So we mentioned it's live. You're probably watching from one of two places. We are streaming on twitch.tv slash AWS. We're also streaming here on LinkedIn Live. So if you're tuning in, if you're watching this live, you have to be on one of those two places. Get those questions, comments, and what have you in. We're really excited to get your comments brought into the broadcast wherever possible. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> it sounds like we were both about to say the same thing. You go ahead. Yeah. So uh, let's give everyone a little bit of a, a run of show of what they can come to expect on this. Uh, again, for returning viewers, this may sound very familiar, but uh, worth a repeat, right? So we talk about a lot of AWS news here. We, we have an episode about every other week. Um, and if it was up to us, trust me, we would have every single launch team on this show uh, where we can pester them with your questions, right? Um, unfortunately, due to mortal constraints and, and time and all of that, uh, we can only get a subset of them. So we try to be very picky with that. Um, that being said, we usually kick things off by talking a little bit about news that we won't have guests from today, things that we thought were generally uh, applicable or exciting to anyone here that's using AWS. Um, but then after we get through that introductory news segment, we get into the guest sessions. Um, and that, I think, is what makes today's particularly special. Um, you've probably seen this already because it's mentioned in the title over on LinkedIn. Um, but for those that are on Twitch that don't see it on there, we're going to be joined in a little bit from the team behind Amazon Nimble Studio. I won't even begin to explain why this is an exciting launch because we have so much to talk about and to see uh, in that session. I know there's been a lot of buzz about it on social media, which we've been excited to see. Um, but with that being said, Rob, you know anything else that I didn't cover? Again, getting people get their questions in, live show, um, follow along if this is something that sounds exciting. We've got some news to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Nimble Studio, I'm pretty excited. You know, One of the things that uh, I really love about this show is I also learn a lot, right? It's, it's uh, the section where, you know, you and I are, are kind of, um, uh, you know, we're in the thick of it. We're trying to drink the fire hose just like everybody in the audience. So it's a, it's a situation where we're kind of learning right alongside you. And I, and I think that's a, it's a pretty cool opportunity for us. Um, and Nimbo Studio, honestly, is one of these things that, that surprised me. It's totally out of left field as far as I'm concerned. We already know that AWS does a lot of different stuff, a lot of different workloads for a lot of different industries. Uh, and I know increasingly we've been investing in the creative space, but this is one of those things where if you would have told me a year ago, hey, uh, we're building this, check it out, I would have been like, are you serious? Is this something that AWS actually does? <laughs> and, uh, and I think that, and I mean that in a completely uh, good way. There's just some things that when people think about AWS, there's still that momentum where people think that it's all about infrastructure. It's all about VPCs and security groups and EC2 instances. And while it is, of course, about those things, on top of that, we built a variety of of higher abstractions uh, in terms of our new service launches. So uh, this is certainly in that, in that bucket of extremely uh, well-packaged set of features, uh, uh, very high in the abstraction stack for uh, what you want to do. So uh, just the kind of stuff that I like to see. Yeah, and before we get into some of the new segments, I guess this is 
half reflecting on what we've featured here in the last year and half, uh, you know, giving people an eye towards what, what is to come, you know, on what's next in the past year, we have featured the launches such as Amazon IVS, interactive video service over an API, fully managed end-to-end -end live streaming. We've featured Amazon Bracket, the quantum computing uh, simulation service. Uh, and and just like when you know we start talking about the breadth of uh, of some of these innovations, I know we see it at reInvent, we see it in keynotes, but um, it's always much more tangible to me when we can actually trick someone from the service team to come onto the show and let us ask them questions, uh, particularly related to how I could get started or how anyone that could be watching could get started with these services and Nimble Studio. Uh, from what I think we have in store in that session. Uh, we'll have a really good idea of exactly what that looks like. So I'm excited for that, but um, enough gushing about that. We'll have more than enough time for that. Um, we have some other new segments, Rob. Anything in particular that jumped out to you in the last few weeks that we should talk about? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the news pieces that caught my attention was the launch of Amazon Files, Windows File Server Gateway. Uh, this is a storage gateway for Amazon FSX for Windows File Server. I know that's a mouthful, but if you're a Windows user, if you work with Active Directory a lot, your company uses Windows and .NET and that sort of thing, which is a lot of companies, by the way, um, you know how important it is to get your file system and your access and your and all your credentials integrated correctly. And uh, so just building up to that for a moment, with Amazon FSX for Windows File Server is a fully managed cloud file server. And think of this as a network directory that you can access via the, the uh, server message block protocol, SMB protocol. Um, and this is just what you know and love. It's imagine that you, you have a Windows server with a Windows file system available on the network and you go slash slash and you go into that directory and there your files uh, are, are all there for you, uh, you and your team, and they're all respecting the permissions in Active Directory. That's exactly what FSX for Windows does, uh, Windows file server does in a nutshell. And this announcement, so FSX for Windows file server has been GA'd for a little while now. This announcement today is uh, that, that we have we now have it available as a storage gateway. So just like our other storage gateway products, it's now possible to connect this to your hybrid networks seamlessly. So you have that entire workflow on-prem in the cloud, whatever workflow uh, uh, works best for you, you can keep that workflow and you can take advantage of all these features via the storage gateway. Yeah, certainly exciting. And, you know, <laughs> talking to the breadth of different announcements that we have on the show, I I'm going to take this in the exact, oh, you know, opposite direction here with my with the next launch that I wanted to talk about, uh, which is actually the open sourcing of uh, the software that drives, no pun intended, the AWS DeepRacer. So a little bit of context first, the AWS DeepRacer is a 118th scale autonomous race car. So think like these RC cars that you could typically manually control. Well, the, the best part about the Deep Racer is that you can actually load machine learning models onto it to be able to have it respond to inputs like a racetrack and have it drive itself. And all of that is backed by a, a, a plethora of um, you know learning materials to be able to figure out in the AWS console how to train those models and to learn about machine learning and, and deep learning for the first time. So Deep Racer has certainly been very exciting for anyone who's come out to summits. Um, you've probably seen the track there with some of the competitions uh, all leading up to big events at reInvent. Um, but now there is an extent, you can extend your deep racer hardware beyond just the, the competitions that are available through the open sourcing of the software. And, and I'll give some examples, right? Um, once you have the ability to take inputs from your environment, you may think, hmm, well, steering left or right around a track is interesting, but what if I attached a Nerf gun to the top of my deep racer and I had it identify particular targets that I wanted to have it pelt around the house? Um, you know, a fun, silly example. Um, but I think that, again, by open sourcing this, this is just the first step. What the community does with the Deep Racer um, and, and the tie-ins that they have to a number of other open source projects that leverage ROS, the robotics operating system, um, I know it's going to be very exciting. I know a lot of developers have been excited and have been asking for this for a long time. So uh, again, Deep Racer's um, uh, software now being open sourced, and there are a number of really exciting template um, projects that you can check out on the GitHub to fork or to just get up and running on your own deep racer hardware. So uh, again, very exciting. Rob, you were just talking about network attached, st attached storage, and I I'm talking about a uh, autonomous, uh, an autonomous racing vehicle. Um, so there's there's certainly no lack of interesting variety here on this show or at AWS. Yeah, the what well, 
I remember when we first announced Deep Racer, uh, one of the most common requests was, can we add this feature? Can we make this hackable? Can we open it up? And I think the team heard that feedback loud and clear, which is what culminated in the response uh, that we see today with the open sourcing of the, the software that runs the machines. Um, yeah, definitely, like you said, looking forward to all the different hacks that the community is going to come up with. Uh, our third new segment, uh, we have JSON and structuralist data support, or semi-structured data support within Amazon Redshift. Now, I'm going to try and keep this at a relatively high level. Amazon Redshift is our data warehouse solution. And it is one of the largest and mat most mature data warehouses out there. I, I, the numbers, the amount of data that, that we process in, in Amazon Redshift on behalf of our customers is truly mind boggling. And <clears throat> but one of the things that, that Redshift does when you put your data into it is that it generally expects that data to be in a structured format. And then you usually query it with SQL or some dialect of SQL. And while SQL is ubiquitous, it's a battle-tested tool, everybody knows it. Uh, what we see is that the, the world of big data is increasingly structureless or semi-structured or dynamic, right? We're talking about data that comes in with some missing fields or some different fields or aliases for fields or fields with different data types uh, uh, between different entries. Um, and in order to handle that, uh, the, the Amazon Redshift team has uh, recently launched support for JSON and semi-structured data. All that means is that um, you can now basically put JSON into the system and everything will work as expected. And I can, I can go into the, the weeds, but we'll drop a link in chat if you wanna check that out. But what this means is that your data warehouse you used to have to kind of make a trade-off like, oh, okay, I've got structureless data. I got a whole bunch of ETL in the middle to sanitize that data, to get it into the data warehouse before I can run my queries. Now you can cut all that out, simplify your infrastructure, and it's all the other features from Amazon Redshift that you know and love. Yeah, very, very interesting launch. Again, just giving developers the flexibility to not have to, you know, shape their workflow around the tool that they're using. A tool wants to feel good in the hand. You want to use a tool to be able to serve yourself, not sort of the other way around. And uh, I think this is just another really good example of, of listening to customers, getting that feedback, and then baking that in in the form of a huge quality of life feature that, you know, for anyone that's working in this space, reduces a ton of uh, additional complexity and infrastructure that they would manage. And I don't know exactly when they are going to be, or they might be. We may have them on the AWS What's Next show. We may have a cut for time se segment with them that, that goes straight to on demand. Um, but if that's at all interesting to you, um, we probably have some more content coming from the, the Redshift team there at some point. So uh, very exciting stuff. Well, last up, I wanted to talk about another launch uh again a four for four on four completely different launches here uh aws nitro enclaves now supporting windows operating system uh so nitro enclaves to the best of my memory and correct me if i'm wrong here rob or, or anyone in chat uh, i'm sure that some of you may have better memory than i do um were announced um on the main stage of reinvent at 2018 or 2019 it was it was one of the two um, with the promise of being able to deliver highly constrained, isolated compute and memory for extremely sensitive workloads. Uh, these are entirely detached, actually, and isolated from an underlying parent EC2 instance as well. So if you have an encrypted file um, and you want that to be processed in complete isolation, that is the purpose of, of uh, you know, what a Nitro Enclave will enable you to solve for. Um, and traditionally, Nitro Enclaves were only supported uh, only supporting Linux operating systems in the VM. Uh, and excitingly now today, for anybody that has Windows workloads that you're looking to get all of the same benefits and security and complete processing and memory isolation for your workloads it is now available for Windows operating systems. Um, I don't have the full list of compatible versions, but I do believe we have a link to the announcement which should have all of the details there. Um, so if that's at all interesting to you, um, check out those links. Those will be added in Twitch chat and LinkedIn chat. Yeah, Nitro Enclave is an interesting service. Uh, to be perfectly frank, I, I think if you're listening in chat here, you're probably not a Nitro Enclave user. But just to give you an analogy, this is like, you know, you ever open those Christmas presents where there's a, there's five different layers of wrappers because somebody's just trying to mess with you? 
that's what a nitro enclave is like. There's just so many layers of defense in depth to make the most secure possible compute environment. One of the really cool things about the nitro system that we were able to do with nitro enclave is that I think you we have the ability to check the the hash of the boot records. So that's one that's one very very obscure way to hack a operating system is to basically mess with the um, uh, how the operating system code loads itself and that Nitro has this unique capability to verify that that loading process has not been tampered with. So we're talking about really when you need the absolute most secure possible compute environment, you're going to reach for Nitro. So just keep that in the back of your head. Someday when you need to process, you know, you need to store your own, uh, uh, I don't know, Coca-Cola recipe or something like that. <laughs> this is where you would do it. Yeah, and you know, you you mentioned Nitro, and then there's Nitro enclaves, and they're actually you know, nitro, the Nitro system is, uh, I believe, you know, like the hypervisor that powers a lot of the virtualized infrastructure here at AWS. And then Nitro Enclaves, an extension of that innovation, the ability to, perf to, to create this like subsystem or like this VM, this isolated VM within an EC2 instance. And I think the coolest part about all of this, right? Like, hey, this, there was a ton of innovation that went into this. This offers extreme isolation in, in a way that, you know, most customers may not need but it's available at no additional cost from the existing EC2 instance that you're using, right? So you can get this extremely, you know, you, you can solve for this extremely difficult need. You know, if I had to build a system myself from the ground up, um, I can't even imagine to think about how I would, I would do this effectively. And again, anytime you're thinking about something like security and locking down data, um, you know, peace of mind that this that what you think you have architected is actually what uh has played out in practice um oftentimes those checks and those com confirmations of assumptions is something that can cost way more than the time that you spent developing something to begin with so hey i can use an aws nitro enclave to securely process things like personally identifiable information at no additional cost for my ec2 instance worked with linux before now it works with windows best of both worlds right so um well that analogy, right? It's not one or the other. Um, but you know, now, now again, sort of just extending the functionality to for for Windows workloads that may be dealing with uh, personally identifiable information or any other extremely secure data. Um, so again, really excited to see that uh, link in chat there for uh, any additional details um, and compatible versions. All right. Well, I think that's all of the new segments that I wanted to talk about here at the top. Um, I know people have still been trickling in and we have one guest for today and one team. What this is going to allow us to do is we're going to spend more time talking about this very, very exciting launch again, Amazon Nimble Studio. Um, but before we get into that, some people trickled in, Rob, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what we do on the show here? Yeah, definitely. Well, this is what's next, the live show that covers latest launches and new feature releases from AWS live show so it's interactive it's right here on twitch and linkedin which means that we want to hear your questions we're going to have a subject matter experts a guest from the service team and we'll take your questions and ask the the guest on your behalf and see where it goes yeah exactly you know people consume launch content in a variety of ways some people love the blog posts other people like um, some explainer videos other people like attending reinvent talks or, or you know watching those after the event um, but you know, you and I get the unique opportunity to get to talk to a bunch of service team members here at AWS. And I think what we learned is that uh, as, as valuable as that is to us, as, as folks working at AWS to create content for developers and, and customers, um, it's just always an engaging time, right? The ability to actually have uh, here at what's next the ability to get service team members to come, uh, especially close to launch time when there's a lot of news around a launch and when folks are most interested in, in learning more about it, the ability to pull them on here and to, to ask a bunch of questions you may not see in existing blog materials. Um, that's, that's really what's exciting for me. And then uh, again, above all else, the show, we love demos and we're getting to see, uh, hand, going hands-on with the service, you know, th that's oftentimes where I feel like I am at the end of a blog post, right? It, you know, I'm, I'm sold. This, this solves my problem. Well, what does it look like to use? And, and, and you know, can I, can I ask a question about some of the things that I see there? That's what we enable on the show, and, and we're really excited about that. Um, we have uh, just a few moments before we're ready to go on with our guest, but I figured since the Amazon Nimble Studio team had this really neat uh, video explaining 
uh, who can make use of it that we could probably roll that because I enjoyed it. I know everyone in chat probably would too. Uh, do you think that would be cool, Rob, if I rolled the, rolled the tape there? I think it would be cool. Awesome. Well, chat, I'm curious if you think it'll be cool. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to roll the footage again. This is uh, Amazon Nimble Studio. When we come back from uh, when we're back on screen here after the video, we'll be joined by one of the members of the service team. Uh, so get your popcorn, get your drinks and sit back and enjoy. See you soon, everyone. Hey everybody. Hey Jack, thanks for coming for Nikki at the last minute. Of course, nice to meet everybody. So are you all okay if I dive right in? Let's go for it. Sounds good. Okay, first off, we need to share the animation for shot 12 in just three days. But I know the team is still cranking on shot 11, so... Got it. We have a great freelancer we can bring in, Mateo. We can get him on it right away, even though he's in New York. Okay, I can set up a workstation, get the software, but I need to make sure we have the right plugins. For it's okay, time. Jack. We can get them up and running within the hour. I'll send a link. Okay, I'll start prepping the files. Previs, the storyboards, the latest cameras. Jack, we're good. The link will have everything he needs. Okay. Uh, next question. With Haley gone, who's going to finalize the fog in shot 12? It says here, Haley's in a cabin in Oregon all month, yep. so... I'm here. I'm gonna doubt the fog to make it feel more volumetric. But Haley, how are you going to make the changes and render it in time? No worries, Jack. I can make the changes on my laptop and then resubmit it to the farm. We have plenty of render capacity. Near infinite, actually. Hey, Jack, uh, let's chat after the call, and I'll explain everything. Thanks. So, I guess this week isn't gonna be as crazy as I thought. Spend more time creating. Amazon Nimble Studio by AWS. The fastest way to set up your content creation studio in the cloud. Built by creators for creators. Visual effects and 3D and 2D animation for film, episodic and commercial work. From storyboard sketch to final deliverable. With on-demand virtual workstations scalable file storage, render farm capacity, and the ability to collaborate remotely. All of this built on the most secure, extensive, and reliable global cloud infrastructure, AWS. All right, I really enjoyed that video. I see some comments in chat, folks liked it as well. Uh, but we do have a new face on the screen here. Joining us to tell us a little bit more about Amazon Nimble Studio is Corbin Gossett, Senior Technical Product Manager over on the team. Corbin, we are ecstatic to be able to have you join us today. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it being here. This is awesome. It's fun to actually see that like kind of go out into the world finally. Welcome to the show, Corbin. Did I, can I believe my eyes? Did we just announce an on-demand render farm? Are you it's, serious? <laughs> it's, 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 it's basically uh, a studio in the cloud and we're, we're providing the infrastructure to, um, you know, allow our customers to kind of build um, and, and, you know, build these content creation pipelines on top of AWS. Um, it's a service that really just, it simplifies how you build and operate and how our customers are going to build and operate these cloud studios. And, you know, if you think about what is needed in a particular studio, it's, it's the kind of these core resources. It's, it's virtual workstations, it's cloud rendering, like you brought up, it's the shared storage, um, you know, high performance storage um, that, you know, our digital content creators need to kind of produce visual effects, animation, interactive content, you know, kind of whatever they want to build. You're right. I, I, uh, I undersold the announcement by calling it a render farm. You're right. It's so much more. It's, but yeah. Can you, can you back up a moment and Educate me about just what problems this industry faces. What, what, you know, you mentioned a lot of different problems we saw in the video. There were things like remote work, uh, different workloads, all the, all the pipeline of different jobs and things that have to come together to make um, video production possible. But take us into the space of challenges. Like what is, what is a day in the life of um, working at one of these studios like, and, and how does this help? So, you know, setting up a studio is, is hard and, and, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges when we're running in like a, an on-prem studio. Um, and, and part of that is the ongoing maintenance. A lot of it's the traditional kind of cloud added value. 
you know, they need to be able to scale. They need to be able to, you know, uh, access talent. Um, and, you know, when you're on-prem, um, some of those things, you know, you're constrained. You're constrained by the resources that you have on, on, you know, within the building. And, you know, what we're doing is allowing that to kind of no longer be stored in the building and, and have that elasticity to be able to scale. And, and whether that's the scaling of the business needs, um, you know, for demand for, you know, artists and, and having a farther reach and a, you know, because, you know, artists are now all over the world and having this global reach to that talent is really important. Um, you know, and if there's a modeler that's, you know, in Idaho that, that you want to get access to, to be able to bring that modeler on for that talent, for his or her talent, uh, is really powerful. We don't have to move them. We don't have to, like, you know, have them, um, you know, send them the hardware, send them the software, those kind of things. We could just spin them up and, and have them start creating content. Um, so it, it's, it's a much easier approach, I think, um, than, than trying to manage everything on-prem. Yeah, I mean, even the term on-premises studio just feels strange to hear to me. I, again, I'm certainly no visual effects expert. I'm just a man who streams with a with a desktop PC and a GPU. That's about the extent of my you know visual effects uh, you know knowledge. But just the thought of a fully cloud studio, right? You know, we saw in the video a day in the life of a studio that that, that faces so many very real challenges and. Uh, we'll get into how Nimble Studio helps to solve for those. And I, I think that was really the, the punchline of, of the video, right? Like, hey, these are real challenges that this new AWS service helps to solve from end to end. Um, but as Rob was talking about before you were on screen, if you had told either of us that AWS was launching a service of this type in, in, in media and entertainment, we would have both been shocked. And, and we are today um, just so su surprisingly different than a lot of the other things that we have, yet so familiar with some of the value propositions. So... Uh, I'm sure there's there's a long story that got the AWS Nimble Studio team to where they are, or Amazon Nimble Studio team to where you are today. Um, is there is there anything you know going back in the chronology here? How did this even start? So we were a, we were an acquisition um, of a small little company called Nimble Collective, um, and we had a, some founders um, Rex Grignon and Scott Lafleur that. Um, you know, that had this idea that, that um, you know, you could do this. They kind of poked around and, and realized that, you know, there was a need to be able to like, hey, we can build a studio and it can be virtualized. I can work from home. I can work from really anywhere. Um, and, you know, in our background, um, it, it's a bunch of kind of ex-Pixar folks. It's a bunch of ex-DreamWorks folks, Weta folks, um, you know, and so we, we had a passion already for kind of, you know, content creation and, and we're all visual effects uh, and feature animation people. And so, you know, the fact that you can actually do this now was kind of the, the, the inspiration of what uh, Nimble Collective became. And so we were a small little startup, you know, we were, we were you know, 25 kind of people that, that had an idea and, and wanted to build this. And so we, we built it and, and we caught the eye of, of AWS uh, and they came in and, and scooped us up. And, and it was interesting because, you know, we thought we understood, you know, scale. We thought we understood security and things like that. And you get acquired by AWS and they, you know, they kind of pat you on the head and go, oh, that's cute, you know. And, um, and so we, we, we learned a ton and it was a, it was a great kind of uh, merger of, of both talent and ideas. And so um, that's where Nimble Studio came. You know, in that intro video, we saw uh, the, the clip where the studio... I guess it was the studio manager who was the stressing person. out a little bit about how they were going to meet their uh, meet their deadlines. Um, I, I and I love war stories from the film industry. So can you can you give us a sense of how realistic that is, or maybe take us into a situation, a similar situation that you've seen personally or you've experienced secondhand? Yeah, it, you know, I spent 15 years at, at DreamWorks Animation as a supervising technical director, and and those those problems are real. It's it's you know just like any project, there's always a crunch mode, and and you know, typically kind of our, if, if you ever looked at the graph of what, what our rendering needs are, it's always this hockey stick. You know, you render that last, you know, 80% of the movie in the last three months. And, and it's not that you haven't rendered the entire film up to that point. It's just the fact that it all changes in the very end and the director has comments and changes and we move this scene around and we cut that scene. Um, and, you know, a lot of times we're like, how are we gonna finish this? And a lot of times that's, you know, we're in there with, you know, spreadsheets and calculators trying to just figure out like, okay, if a frame is taking, you know, 36 hours to render, we have this much compute capacity, like, how are we going to do this? And so that producer kind of asking those questions is very real. It happens today. And, 
and we're, we're noticing a lot of these studios that are, you know, and this is where burst rendering is coming from, right? There's a bunch of studios out there, and especially at the tier one top level, that already take advantage of AWS. And they're already rendering, and they're already using that burst capacity so that they can finish these jobs. Um, and not only finish these jobs, but take on new jobs, um, because they have that capacity to kind of keep that, that train going. Yeah, now you mentioned uh, while you were at, at DreamWorks, you know, you, you had this ever-growing uh, demand for rendering capacity, but I assume you know you did, they didn't have access to something like Nimble Studio. So how did they solve the problem back then? So back then we had to buy hardware, right? Like we didn't have, you know, you had to bring in, um, if we hired a couple freelancers to come in to help, you know, finish a film, or if we had to, you know, to buy that, that uh, rendering, um, you know, uh, we had to go out to a, a vendor and get it. Um, and, you know, sometimes it was shopping around to try to find a, a vendor. And then, you know, other times it's like, there just wasn't enough hardware out there and we had to scramble. Um, and so it, 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 it was, it was a problem that, that, um, that came up a lot and, you know, we had to basically solve that uh, on-prem. And sometimes, you know, we, some things sneak through that you might miss uh, and then you go back to the DVD and you watch, it's like, oh, we should have re-rendered that. And we just didn't have the time, you know, you kind of shake your head wishing we just had that extra little bit of oomph at the very end to be able to do that. Um, and so with Nimble Studio, you know, you have that elasticity and, and the goal is to, to be able to help our customers kind of make that transition onto um, a more virtualized kind of production content creation pipeline um, where the resources are less of the issue. Like we want, we want our customers spending time creating content. We want them doing what they do best, which is the art side of the, the project, not the infrastructure managing the disk and managing the, you know, the storage and, and where the render farm is. It's like that stuff should just work. That shouldn't be a hindrance. Um, and, and that's our goal. You are a, uh saying all of the magic words to me corbin and uh rob is gonna smirk in a second if he catches on to what i'm about to say but helping people spend the time on the things that they're really good at that deliver value and you know the case of a studio visual effects right and rendering and spend less time on the nuts and bolts of, of housekeeping and racking and stacking infrastructure there's a term for that here in cloudland and that's called undifferentiated heavy lifting bam point for nick uh, up, up the counter on the wall. It has been zero days since Nick last said undifferentiated heavy lifting. But you know, whether it's a software engineer having to rack and stack hardware or an artist having to rack and stack hardware to do their rendering job, it, it just sounds silly to say, but just is such uh, uh, has been such a requirement in the industry. And um, you know, when we're talking about elasticity, the ability to have infrastructure on demand, I'd imagine it's even more stressful because if all of the, if so much of the rendering happens at the tail end of the project, when you're close to deadlines, tensions are high, you're making decisions to, to cut, you know, A or B thing that could both be extremely impactful in the final deliverable. This really just feels like a lose-lose situation, right? No one wants to worry about this, but they're constrained by it. And, yeah. um, you know, in a sense, I'd say this probably impacts people even more than software, you know, outside of like scalability problems, right? But um, it, it is just so interesting to me. You know, we've been in the more generic software world talking about, you know, the ability to have hardware on demand and, and, and you know, the ability to scale up and scale, scale down. And it feels like the media and entertainment and, and, you know, the visual effects in particular industry has been feeling these same pains for all of the same amount of time. But until something like Nimble Studio that can tap into that natively, this feels like a really transformative change. Am I am I missing anything being someone that's definitely not uh, an expert here in the VFX space? No, and I, I, you know I think you summed it up really well. The 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 media and entertainment industry and and not completely has has been um, you know a lot of other industries have already made the transition to cloud you know, streaming and, and medical and, and, you know, banking and all that kind of stuff. And, and the visual effects industry, um, you know, especially uh, around security have kind of been slow for that adoption. And, um, you know, there's been, there's been things in the past where, where something gets out about a movie or, you know, something slips out and, and that's always been a concern. Um, and I think AWS is, is, you know, from a security level now has proven that that is no longer an issue, right? Like that is something that, that people can, um, you know, can kind of check off their list and, and really concentrate on like, okay, how do I actually make this, you know, migration happen? Like what is the story for company A to, to start that process? And it's always been the hang up with security. 
um, because they didn't want that IP to get out, right? That was the, that IP is what they're all about. And so, you know, today you've got, you know, you've got Netflix on AWS and you've got, you know, all these kind of large um, uh, companies and content creators rendering already on AWS. So that, that, that kind of wave has already gone by and, and people are already starting to make that transition. I think your point about security is really good because uh, the change hits different industries at different times, but when it yep. does hit, it seems to really sweep over the industry quickly. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was working in a fintech company. And when I first started there, um, you know, we were designing a trading system. We were thinking about, hey, how would this work in the cloud? And the feedback in the first couple of years was, there's no way we would use a cloud trading system. Yeah. And the feedback toward the end of the, the end of the project was, there's no way we would not use a cloud trading system. We will never use an on-premise one. Yeah. So, so it's, it's really interesting to see the, the, the trend both within this industry, within a given industry, and then across industries in terms of how transformative cloud computing can be. Yeah, the, um, you know, there's a trade show called SIGGRAPH, which is kind of the big industry, you know, graphics trade show that happens in the summer every year. And, you know, it, it, it's been interesting to watch kind of the story of cloud um, kind of consume that, that trade show a little bit in the sense that, you know, five years ago, and even a little longer than that is, is people were talking about cloud. It's like, oh, it's out there. Yeah, this seems like this is really cool. Like, it's just, it's just a conversation. Um, you know, and then three years ago, the conversation turned more to be like, okay, you know, we're interested, we're coming up with a plan, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna figure this out. And, and it wasn't, it wasn't no longer just a conversation. It was like, okay, we're gonna start figuring this out and, and plan for it. You know, and then two years ago, it started happening, like really like, you know, and, it, and it's not that there weren't people before that, but really the kind of the wave started really to, to push through. And, you know, and then this year, it, it's no longer about like, you know, coming up with a plan. It's like, when can I get on the cloud? Like when, when can I move my studio onto the cloud? Um, and, and that's what I'm really excited about in this conversation is like, how do we help those customers, you know, do that? And we've, we've noticed that, you know, that in the past couple of years, it's gone from like, you know, we had one studio, uh, Untold Studios out of the UK um, that went completely 100% virtual, you know, and it changed the way they work. It changed their process, their workflow and their pipelines. And they're able to take advantage of, of these kind of, you know, microservices, containerized type workflows that cloud brings that a lot of industries have already kind of taken advantage of. Um, but it just brings this new power that, that you didn't have. Uh, before. And so now we're, we're starting to see these little, we kind of call these pop-up studios. It's like, you know, it's a couple guys that have been in the industry for 20 years and they want to spin off and start their, their own company. And in the past, it'd be like just the, the sheer amount of work to do that with buying all the hardware and getting all of that was just overwhelming. And so they never did that. And now, you know, these, these four or five people can, you know, come together in a remote location and, and they can spin up a studio and they can actually start doing work. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty powerful statement. I think that's happened within the last year, you know, the really people are starting to kind of notice that and, and go, holy, you know, mackerel, I can do that. Yeah. I, I think you're bringing up a really interesting point now. So at this point, you've highlighted the fact that this increases access to global talent. It increases the security posture of your workloads. It streamlines the pipeline and your schedules. But that last point you made, I, I hadn't even considered how Amazing that is because you're talking about the democratization of this process where a small team of people, four or five people can go and start their own studio. Whereas prior, that was difficult because of the upfront capital necessary to play on the same field as the, in the big leagues, as the, as the big studios, right? Yeah. But what this means, if I understand you correctly, is you're going to have a lot of smaller studios accessing the same capabilities as the best studios out there, which means more content, less time for that content to go to market. It's just a, a double whammy of, of, uh, of, of awesome new forms of entertainment that we're gonna see. Yeah, and if you, if you look at the last year, I've spent a lot of time on you know, Netflix and Disney Plus and, and you know, Prime Video, and, and it's like, there's a lot of that kind of content um, consumption. And so there's all these new models um, and outlets for this consumption. And what needs to feed that is this kind of train behind it to create all that content. Uh, and there's not enough content creators out there. And so what's cool is to see these smaller studios start to pop up and go, 
you know what? I can actually, I can compete with the big boys to some extent, right? Like I don't need that huge, you know, team of DevOps and I don't need that huge team of, you know, render wranglers. I can, I can spin it up with me and a couple guys and a couple gals and I can get some work done and, and, you know, make a difference. And so that, that's really cool. Is, is that the job title I was supposed to put under your name? Is it Render Wrangler or is it uh, – <laughs> I've never heard that one before. I always say, you know, wrangling is the best verb to talk about, to use when talking about wringing out data and trying to make it look the way I need it to. But Render Wrangling just rolls off the tongue so much better. Yeah, it's an actual role. You know, a lot of, a lot of companies have, have people that are dedicated to wrangling the jobs that are – you know, you have so much compute that happens – within let's say a feature animated film that's you know 88 minutes long um and has you know 145 million uh render hours uh worth of compute and so that has to be managed at some level and and you know we back in dreamworks we we had a team of render wranglers that were there 24 7 and they kept that thing going and they would keep that you know farm running and so now you know with this kind of the ability to scale and elastically build up that farm um, that's a role that's going to continue to be needed. So, you know, like what's, what I'm thinking about here is the idea that like, okay, you know, Amazon EC2, Elastic Cloud Compute, the ability to have instant instances with, with, uh, compute on demand have existed, but you'd have to then have extensive cloud expertise to string those together and build your own internal, uh, system or framework that would leverage those for the needs of something like video processing. Um, and I would say that, you know, as the years yep. have gone on, there's been more and more and more building blocks and tools to enable, you know, well-resourced, well-staffed, um, larger studios, I'd venture, who can dedicate headcount to building some of those things. Um, but to my understanding, Nimble Studio basically takes those and powers it on the back end, but offers those easily to the folks that would want to make use of them, thus reducing the need for, uh, you know, as many of these data wranglers or folks that would have to build these systems from scratch. So it's more of a more of a solution than a set of tools that people have to assemble themselves to solve a problem in their industry. Yeah, and, you know, in a nutshell, Nimble Studio provides really kind of the the orchestration and management of those cloud-based resources. And that includes, you know, your on-demand GPU-based workstation. Uh, it includes your high-speed storage, you know, your access to your compute render farms. Um, and really we tie kind of all that infrastructure together with our back end. Um, and we then provide the virtual workstations through, you know, through our service account. Um, and then the content creation happens on these workstations with the artist. Um, and, um, you know, they're the ones that's doing the magic. We're just providing the infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, our, our goal is to kind of um, lower that bar of entry to help them uh, build that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, you bring up kind of the, the, the parts and the building blocks. It's like, you can do this today. There are studios that are building this today on top of AWS. And it, it is the orchestration of all those little Lego bricks that, you know, they put together to create that studio. Um, and for a lot of people that, that kind of you know, entry level is, is difficult. Like you have to have cloud expertise. You have to have the DevOps exper expertise. You know, you have to understand kind of how cloud works. And so by us lowering that bar, we can get these people in to just kind of, hey, I can set up a studio in, in you know, what, what is now a couple hours versus like weeks or months. Uh, and I can begin creating content by the end of the day. You know, if I have a job that comes up and it's like, can I do that job? You know, it's like, yeah, I can spin up a Nimble Studio um, I can get the data uploaded with the storyboards and I can begin creating content by the end of the day. That's a, that's a pretty powerful statement. Awesome. You know, I, yeah, you, you mentioned, I want to hear, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I was just going to say, you know, we've, we, we saw in that introduction video, the, the ways in which Nimble Studio will solve for some of those very practical problems in the day of, uh, in the day of a studio. We talked about security previously. We've talked about the ideas of compute, but Let's get sort of down to brass tacks. Nimble Studio as a service. Uh, can we talk about the features directly of compute and of collaboration? What do these look like to use? What are my options when it comes to being able to um, configure my studio or, or to just, like submit a rendering workload? Uh, tell me, tell me sort of what that looks like. Or from you mean like a just a uh, uh, feature standpoint? Yeah, like a feature standpoint, and also. Uh, it, 
But it's yep. sort of like what is the, what is the end to end ecosystem here that that Nimble Studio covers? And this is sort of a uh, an extension of some questions I see in chat. People are wondering is is this part of my workload for for rendering? Is this an entire studio? Like what are sort of the entry points and deliverables that Nimble Studio end to end yep. delivers? And then let's get into the features that enable that. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if if you think about a content production pipeline, it's more than just compute, right? There, there's obviously there's um, there's the compute aspect of the render farm. And that's that's what people kind of traditionally have thought when it comes to cloud and content production, because it, it's the burst rendering, right? It's, it's I need to kind of, you know, I'm, I'm strapped for on-prem and I need to burst the rendering. But what we provide is actually more than that. It's, it's the access to the high-speed storage. So if, if you, um, uh, one of the big changes kind of from the pre-acquisition is that we managed a lot of that stuff. Uh, we manage the storage, we manage the compute farm, we, we manage the, the software and the licensing. And when we got acquired, we kind of took a step back and really wanted to concentrate kind of on, you know, are we building the right thing? We did a lot of customer validation um, and we, you know, we, we kind of took a step back and realized giving that control back to the customer is more what they want. They want to be able to easily orchestrate that infrastructure and, and build it up, um, but they also want control of that. So for example, storage, you can bring your own storage. Um, you know, whether that's an FSX for Lustre or FSX for, for, um, uh, for Windows, um, if you want to bring a Weka system or a Cumulo system, like those are the, the ideas that you can bring that um, and associate that with your studio. So if you're, for example, doing cloud rendering already, um, you may be having a bunch of stuff on-prem, uh, you're, you're pushing it up to the cloud to render on, F on an FSX uh, storage solution. Um, you don't have to bring it back down. You could just go ahead and associate that storage you already have with your Nimble Studio, and then you could just spin up a workstation and already see that data and have access to that. So you don't have to pull that, continue to go through that round robin kind of process. Um, you know, a big part of that, if we look at the features, it's, it's the workstation, right? Providing the orchestration of those workstations. Um, we rely on the nice TCV protocol, um, which is, you know, another Amazon uh, streaming protocol that we have. Um, that gives us access to, you know, you can have up to dual uh, 4K monitors streaming at 60 frames a second. Um, those are all GPU backed uh, instances. And so the horsepower is there that, that these kind of artists are going to need. And what's really cool, you know, is that you can provide, the studio administrator can provide access to the types of machines that are needed for a particular task. So if it's a small little task, I can run just on a, you know, 4XL large. Um, but if I'm, you know, doing this huge simulation where I've got a bunch of smoke and fire and hair and everything like that, I may need access to, you know, 16XL large because I need that extra oomph to be able to push through that simulation. And we've, we've noticed that we've seen customers that have tried to do simulations on prem and they just don't have the horsepower and I have to go buy a new machine. I have to spec it out. I have to, you know, it takes, we're here. I can just shut down my instance, spin up another instance, have access to the same data that's right there. And I can start working on that with a larger machine. So if I need that horsepower, it's available. If I don't need it, I don't have to use it. And that's that's really the cool part about the workstations. It sounds a question about me. these these compute instances. Uh, you know, you, we we mentioned that they um, they can be elastically scaled up and down mm -hmm. to form a, a to have burst rendering capacity. And a lot of these workloads, of course, can be accelerated by GPUs. Um, just for my personal interest, what kind of GPUs are we talking about? Are these the specialized exotic GPUs like the Quadro class GPUs that we see from from NVIDIA, or are they kind of off the shelf, you know, gaming GPUs today, no, or, or the, does it matter? It, it does. I mean, these are enterprise based uh, GPUs from NVIDIA. They're the Tesla uh, T4s. Um, and so you have access to those, um, you know, um, and th that includes, which is, you know, I think what we're starting to see a lot of is the more real time rendering, you know, through kind of game engines and that, that kind of capability. There's a lot of, there's a lot of software renders that are now kind of, you know, what they call hybrid renders where they take advantage of both the hardware, you know, GPU acceleration, as well as the software. Um, and then there's, you know, there's things like Epic Unreal and, and Unity where, you know, they're actually real time uh, game engines. And those are great for creating content. And the fact that they have, you know, access to R the RTX libraries uh, on NVIDIA, they get the ray tracing uh, that, you know, it's kind of all the buzz in the game world, but it's also good for content creators. They can actually go and create, you know, these, these fascinating scenes um, and do that. And, and it's funny because I think people get caught up into real time. If, if I'm rendering a complex scene in something like uh, Unreal, like for me, I don't care if it's 60 frames a second or one frame a second. The fact that I'm getting a frame a second 
that I can render at a good quality that I can use for a Saturday morning cartoon. I don't have to render that, you know, on some, uh, like for, you know, five hours on the render farm. That's a huge win. Um, so that's what these RTX kind of libraries bring, um, you know, with access to on these, on these GPU back workstations. I'm, I'm really glad you brought up real time rendering. I, I hadn't, I wasn't even thinking about that, but now that you mention it, yeah, I mean, the, the, the latest generation of Unreal and Unity and, and Crytek engines are so good that, I, I mean, I, I could be totally fooled. If you showed me a screenshot of that from, from something that, that took a lot longer time to render, I, I doubt I could tell the difference. Are, are there, is that seeing a lot of adoption in the film industry these days? Where people yeah, the, the to, or the game engines to render films? Yeah, there's there's a lot of adoption. You know, this whole kind of there's this new wave of virtual production. You know, a lot of the stuff that you've seen kind of with the with the Mandalorian and ILM and, and you know and stuff like that, where they're they're creating kind of this content with these you know LED walls. Um, it, it's fascinating. Like I was at SIGGRAPH a couple of years ago, they were showing this off where. Um, you know, you had this virtual LED wall where the, the, the art, the, the actor is basically sitting in front of LEDs behind him on the sides and above, and you can change the location, the lighting, the time of day all in real time. And, you know, there's tons of videos out there on, on YouTube about the, you know, the Mandalorian and, and they're fascinating to watch because that, that whole virtual production uh, is, you know, is, is, and that's taken advantage of that real time rendering. Um, and so, you know, whether you're doing it, um, you know, on a sound stage or whether you're doing it in the cloud, um, having access to that is awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's fascinating. The day where I can have a personal uh, Unreal Engine based environment for the reInvent stage that we can use for AWS What's Next, I will be over the moon. But uh, it sounds yeah. like I need to start dabbling in Unreal Engine and Unity and my skills are the only thing holding me back and not, not some of the hardware there. Um, so silver lining some some exciting stuff <laughs> that i could that i could do there um you know i i'm I, a big blind spot i have here is the tools of the trade here um you know it's it's clear from a, a cloud person in in air quotes here sort of the the moving pieces the hardware needs the infrastructure needs um but we're talking about something that is is um you know, anything artistic preferences and tools that feel good for folks to use or that they have skills with, uh, I'm sure are going to play a big part in, in how uh, some of these tools will play together, right? Like people want to use things that feel good. They want to use things that they're skilled with. And in art and visual effects, I certainly have very little experience there. Um, what does what does that sort of landscape look like? The tools that visual effects artists use and, and, and how they play together to make use of something like Nimble Studio or, or how art studios even choose tools to use? Because I have very little understanding here. So in the, in the kind of the content creation market, there's a set of kind of core tools that people rely on. You know, there's, there's the uh, Autodesk Maya, there's the Foundry with Nuke, um, you know, and even now Epic is part of that conversation and Unity with the Unreal and, um, you know, and Unity. And, and so um, a, a, a lot of those tools um, people use very differently. Um, they have pipelines built around their workflows and those tools. And so, you know, it's one of these things where we, we didn't want to be prescriptive with Nimble Studio and say, oh, here's, you know, here's access to the tool. So we took a very different approach where it's much more, again, with the storage and the, the kind of the AWS resources. It's also with the tools. It's a BYO approach. So if you have a proprietary tool that you rely on in your production pipeline, we want you to use it. Like we don't want people to have to change the way that they work just to move to the cloud. Um, we want them to be comfortable with the tool sets that they already use, that the artists are comfortable with day in, day out. Um, so that, you know, when an artist basically logs into Nimble Studio, it's no different. They don't, they don't see a change. Um, and that means we're successful because that, that allows the artist just to kind of sit down, be comfortable, take a deep breath, and then start to, you know, create content. And that, that is the, the BYO approach. So, you know, you could bring your own AMIs. So if you have software that you want to build onto your AMIs, you can also build, you know, install software onto a, a shared file system if you're running Linux. Um, you know, we support both Windows uh, and Linux. And so that, that allows the customers, you know, we have customers that are, um, that are just Windows-based. You know, they rely on, you know, Studio Max or Cinema 4D. Um, and then we have a lot of high-end customers that rely on Linux. And, you know, they're going to be using Maya or Nuke and Katana. And so, you know, not only can they bring those tools, but they get to control the cadence at which those tools are upgraded. Because one of the things that, you know, back in the production days, 
you don't change once that production starts. You know, unless something breaks, you're stuck with that version of software all the way through that production process. And, and a lot of times, you know, like in a, if you think of feature animation where you have maybe a two to two and a half year schedule, you know, you start off on a version of software and that by the time you release the film, you're still on that old version of software because you don't want to change. And so we can't, as a service, just kind of pull the rug out from our customers and change to a new, the latest version of software. So we want that to be in the hands of the customers so that they can control that cadence. And that's, that's the BYO approach with software. That's going to be the really fun now that we've entered into the world of game development tools. I think uh, every game developer's most dreaded day is when they wake up and it's like there's a Unity update, major, <laughs> major Unity update. Yep. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, they, they, they want to, um, you know, sometimes they want to be able to, to run multiple versions, right? And so, you know, they may have different AMIs, which is their test AMI, so that they can spin up a workstation, have access to the same data, make sure the newest version of Maya or Nuke works with their scenes, you know, and then they can slowly roll that out to the rest of the, the, the studio. Yeah. yeah. Another thing about you mentioned about the workflow is, the, so it is bring your own tools, but there's also another element that you mentioned earlier that I think is really valuable. And you talked about uh, integration with elastic file systems like FSX for Windows File Server. And what occurs to me is that you, you kind of get the best of both worlds because you get the ability to customize your workflow on top of that. And you're, you have yep. this, this persistence layer as this network attached storage, the virtualized file storage, hybrid file storage to the, the um, storage gateway should you need it. Uh, but what you also have is access to the rest of AWS in that sense. Yeah. And the rest of the best practices and the tools that we have there. For example, something even as simple as backups, right? Yeah. Uh, backing up your, 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 your daily renders might be a good idea in case, yep. you know, some, some studio that should not be, be, be named here uh, loses <laughs> their render a couple weeks before the release of the film, right? Like, yeah. like uh, um, I, I think that's, there's a set of best practices that comes with this kind of prescribed vertically integrated solution. That, that customers are going to discover over time that I think could also be really useful. Yeah, what we're seeing now is a lot of studios that are moving to the cloud are taking what is traditionally kind of their legacy workflows and pipeline that they've done for you know the last 20, 25 years, right? Like they're moving basically from the on-prem to the cloud and, and the, but they're not changing their workflows. And what we're excited to see and starting to see is people taking advantage of what's there in the cloud. And kind of what I mentioned earlier, it's like other industries have already gone through this kind of process. But turning your pipeline into what used to be a traditional kind of like, you know, almost like a pull pipeline where it's like, I'm going to run and execute this script on a bunch of files and it's going to do something. I can now start taking advantage of microservices and Lambda and things like that, where I can send something out, have it, you know, through a service. Um, I could build a service within my pipeline and have it sit on top of AWS so that, you know, whenever I check in a file, let's say I'm using something like, you know, Autodesk Shotgun to drive my workflow. Um, I can actually trigger that to run a bunch of events in the background that automate a lot of the process. Um, and, you know, and today a lot of these pipelines are about automation. Like how do we make it easier to automate, you know, data going through the pipeline, but now bring into the, bring that into AWS and you just have, you know, and one of our SAs actually said this the other day, which I really liked is, you know, you now have the sandbox of all these cool toys that you get to play with and experiment with to help kind of advance how you work on a daily basis within that pipeline. And that, that's something that you just didn't have on-prem. And now I have access, like all the things you were talking about earlier, kind of pre, before I came, came on, it's like, how do I look at each one of those new services and figure out how I can integrate that into my workflow? Because there's some value there in, in a lot of those. And, and, you know, there's so many, it's like, I don't even know where to start sometimes. You know, uh, I'm thinking more about, you know, the story of, of committing to a software version for production that you then stick through all the way to the end. And, you know, two and a half years down the line, there may be really interesting features that have been released that you may wish you could have used, but obviously some of the trade-offs may not be worth it. I'm thinking about the hardware return of investment and server farms and how long that cost is usually, uh, you know, the ROI is amortized over, right? When, when you're buying server farms, you're probably thinking like, hey, this is a 10, 15, 20 plus year investment to, to make sure that this is the right decision for us. And, uh, you know, I think even consumers, people watching on Twitch here, if you're a gamer, you understand this with things like the which GPU to get, right? You know, like I'm, I'm streaming here. I've got yep. my NVIDIA GTX 1080. Um, but, you know, now there's like the, the 2000 series and the 3000 series. And it's like, I have to wonder like, well, is this performance at this price worth it? And how long will I plan to keep this and then upgrade? And 
I can only imagine that the film industry and, and you know visual effects probably deals with the same problem. But one of the biggest values of moving to the cloud is that as those new instances get released, all you have to do is flip your config to the latest version of that and you start accessing yeah. the best price to performance and there's basically no heavy lift to perform that conversion. That's AWS's zone in the in the shared responsibility uh, sort of sphere and the product offering here. And then you can just simply get access to that to that um, you know oftentimes and how I'd imagine this looks. You know your render farm. You don't care as much about the exact hardware as long as it it, it works. And it's all about how long does it take to render, how much does that cost, and, and beyond. So um, again, it's 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 valuable to, to us here as as people that may play games or or stream. But uh, you know, you multiply that across the amount of compute that's necessary for rendering visual effects, and I can imagine that that is a bit more than just a drop in the bucket. Yeah, it's a it's a change from the you know the traditional kind of capex to opex you know kind of uh, business model, and you know, but with that comes all these advantages that you know, like as AWS makes these updates, you get those right. Those are that's part of the that's part of the plan, and, and you can to take advantage of that. So if FSX comes out with a new feature, you know, that makes it faster, that just kind of falls into place, and you know, now my production pipeline is is faster, um, and so that that's not something that you traditionally get with the on prem infrastructure it's a it's a major lift in order to kind of get to the next gen of hardware um, but with nimble studio that that you get that for free you know that just kind of comes with with being part of the the service so i think i have a really strong understanding here of, of the ways in which nimble studio helps to solve some of these really gnarly big infrastructure big dollar sign uh challenges but let's talk a little bit more about the uh, the people portion of it. We saw that in the video, you know, the onboarding of a new um, yep. artist or an editor. Um, obviously, hardware traditionally was on-premises, probably centralized by the office. Um, but there's so much else that goes into it, right? Think about new hire orientation. You have to onboard folks. You have to train them up on maybe the tool chain that you use, give them their credentials, walk around the corner, get access to the data where that lives. Nimble Studio surely addresses some of these collaboration challenges, right? Yeah, what, what we we've been doing demos, kind of you know pre uh, pre release and to, to some, and and you know we've had producers, and it's funny because that video is actually very kind of accurate in the sense of like you know oh my gosh how do I how do I onboard a freelancer how do I get somebody up to speed on a project that you know they don't have access to the data and and that's a real that's a real problem and the, the way we're approaching that is you know I can spin up an artist in, in no time you know if they're a part of the studio I can share the the resources that they need access to um, you know it, just like that I mean it's just, it's literally like you share documents in traditional kind of you know cloud sharing um, and and what's great about that is that you know traditionally if I'm hiring a freelancer, I have to I have to make a bunch of decisions. One, do they have their own hardware um, that they can use? Uh, and if not, we have to send them hardware. If they do have their own hardware, do they have the right software? Um, do they need to upgrade their software to the same version that we're using on the production? Do they have the right plugins? You know, then and and, and that's just even before you get to the like getting them the data. Um, and then you got to ask the question of like, okay, this this artist needs you know a terabyte of data. Uh, in order to do their job, it's like so. Okay, how do I get them a terabyte of data? Do I, you know, they can't download that through Dropbox or something like that. I mean, they could, but that just seems like a huge amount of kind of waiting and and, and just sitting there. Um, I could send them a drive, um, but then you know, it's like now I've got data that's out in the real world, and it's like, what happens if that gets lost? And that drive has you know proprietary information, IP, like all that kind of information. To, and to, while you're while you're saying I can this, just share to, with them. To, to, to reiterate what you just said, send them a drive. You are literally saying like, I, you know, courier service or like mailing someone a hard drive. Yeah. Uh, and, and just, you know, because in some instances for like a terabyte of data and depending on where they are, where you are, like that, that's been done before and has been not an uncommon practice for remote uh, artists. Is, is, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yeah. Now I just, you know, I basically add, add this freelancer to the studio and share the project with them and they have access to the, the software that, that we're all using in, in internally in the production. They have access to all the, the hardware that's needed, the plugins, everything. Um, and the data is there. They're sharing the, uh, we're looking at the same data at the same time. It's a shared file system that, you know, that I can CD to and touch a file and you can CD and load it. And so, you know, when I'm making the changes, you're seeing those updates and it's no longer like, hey, what happened to that version? Can you send me that? Oh, I, I thought I did. It's final, final version 12. No hero version. Like, 
you know, that's all part of now, you know, accessible by the same people. And so um, that, that's, that's really cool. Well, and I think you also mentioned another cool thing about this kind of remote style of work and the, the, the teaser video also touched on this is uh, the ability to access talent anywhere. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I, I think this is, this is something that, that the tech industry has been struggling with for a long time. And I think other industries are, are struggling with it to varying degrees. The, the talent truly is global, right? Yeah. It's, it's all over the place. And it's so ridiculous that we still have a lot of industries that are, that are operating this mindset of, well, we're just going to hire local people because yep. that's just the way we used to do it. Uh, I mean, imagine what they're missing out on in terms of some, you know, the next great 3D modeler or VFX artist or this the person who can really make that one scene just be so memorable and yeah. so visually style, uh, uh, unique. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think companies that are, that are in that mentality of like, I can only hire local are going to be limited um, because there is this global talent pool. And, and, you know, and especially over this last year where, that flexibility of being able to work from anywhere is so important. And even if I'm still on prem in the same building of a local production studio, the fact that I can like, you know, I could sit on prem in a screening room, submit a render, I could jump on the train, I can check a frame, you know, through through my phone or whatever. Um, I can stop at Starbucks and I can bring up my laptop and make a quick change. Um, and then I go home and it's like, I can log in and check my render to make sure it's going it's the same environment for me. So as an artist, I'm not like changing context or anything like that. I'm logging into my same desktop. I'm logging into my same machine. I still have Maya up and running. It was simulating while I was riding on the train home. And I just jump in to check to make sure it, it you know, babysit it, make sure it's working uh, the way I expect. And if not, I make those changes and, and I don't have to then like, you know, bring my laptop back in. It's like, no, I just send an email to my producer and say, Hey, the, the latest version's there. It, it, it worked while I uh, kind of went home. So um, that, that talent pool, um, has been following, you know, like there's certain hubs in the kind of content creation industry, you know, there's LA, there's Vancouver, there's Montreal, there's Singapore, there's London, you know, those have been kind of the key big content creation hubs, um, especially for visual effects, um, and feature animation. And I think, you know, people are starting to see like, Hey, I can live out in the countryside. I can have a, you know, good life kind of work balance with, with being able to have this access. As a matter of fact, when, when we were testing, um, you know, kind of doing cloud production in the cloud internally, um, you know, one of our animators um, was affected by the, I'm up here in the Bay area, um, was affected by the Santa Cruz fires that were happening. Um, and they had to evacuate. Um, you know, and, and it was funny because we were all worried about like, you know, um, this animator and, and, you know, what she's going through as a family and, and very concerned. And she was so happy that she could spend her time, like her mind could concentrate just on animation. She loves animation. Um, and the fact that she could do that and just log in and continue working, like she had to literally vacate their home. They were staying in a hotel. But while they were staying in a hotel, she can continue to work. And, and, you know, we felt bad. It's like, no, 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 don't work. Like, no, you take care of that. And she's like, no, this is my therapy. This is helping. And so, you know, that was really cool that, that she could just pick up and continue working and not have to think about life that was going on right outside the door, you know? That's a fascinating story and a, and a really good point. I think the, the talent point is, uh, it's underrated. I think it's going to be huge in the years to come. But I, okay, as you're telling me that, though, I, I have, I have a problem with that story. And that's, okay. you know, like, if you're going to put, because you told me earlier, hey, four or five of your closest friends from, from, you know, back when you, you, were, you used to work at DreamWorks can just go and start their own startup. And they have access to the infrastructure and the workflow and the processes and they have all these, you know, all this thing that can access global talent. But how are you guys going to publish the, the montage where you put the team together, you know? Well, you go to each one of them and you say, I'm putting together a team and you put a suitcase on the table and you'd like show them, I don't know, a, a, bunch, a bunch of dollar bill or something. <laughs> if you, if it's all remote, how are you going to have that montage scene? You know, it's, uh, it's funny. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's a good point. It's it's like the, there's still something about being in the same room and there always will be. Um, and, but, but the fact that, you know, we're in one room on, on, you know, Monday and Tuesday, and then I can go home and work from home. Um, that's, that's what I want. I want to be able to kind of, you know, have that flexibility, but you're right. Like, you know, you, you need to build that kind of, how did, how did this company come together video? Um, and if they're all like through this, through zoom, that that's your montage. 
yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm just teasing. I think this is awesome. I think this is just you know, I'm thinking about the the, the Rick and Morty episode where they did the the heist and they're like, I'm putting together a team. And that's what I'm, that's what's going through my head as you're describing the access because it's true, right? You have access to the best people in the world now. Yep. Um, and as long as you can you can get them hooked up globally, then they can do their work, right? Yeah. yeah. So you know, on the topic of uh, accessing a larger pool of talent, I actually have a question from LinkedIn that I wanted to ask on on this um, same thought process. And you know, in tech as well, uh, the, the talent pool gets fragmented based on the skills that people have, right? So you know, you're hiring for a Java developer or a Python developer or you know what have you, right? So I'm thinking, I'm sure there's a bunch of tools in the visual effects industry. Um, what does use of Nimble Studio look like with some of the tools that people know and love? So you mentioned like Maya before, um, you know, again, as a, as a noob here, like is there, I'm sure there may be tools in the Adobe suite. Do any of those play into Nimble Studio, and and after you answer that, let's actually get into the demo because I know people in chat are are chomping at the bit to actually see this because they're very excited. Yeah, you know, it kind of we, we we touched on it a little earlier is like we we are not being prescriptive about those tools. So you know whether that's the Adobe Creative Suite, um, whether that's the you know kind of the content uh, DCC apps like Maya and Nuke and and Katana and those kind of things. Like we're we're not controlling that. Um, we're we're um, we we want the customer to be able to bring the tools that um, their workflows and their tasks in terms of whatever those creative tasks are require. Um, and sometimes that's proprietary tools, which we you know like we don't have any access to that. It's not like we can go down to you know the local software vendor and and get that proprietary tool. Those are built for very turnkey kind of solutions by the customers, and so we want them to be able to bring those and run those, whether it's on Linux or on, on Windows. So. Um, you want me to jump in and, and kind of show you around a little bit? Yeah, I, I, I we could talk your ear off all day, but Chad is like, please show it to us. Like, I, I'm ready. I want to see what I have in store for myself. So, so please uh, help me fend them off by getting into the demo so that we can all see this for ourselves. All right, let me. Yeah, you can, can blame me. I I, uh, I got a little carried away picking Corbin's brain here. It's not always that I get to uh, have some have a guest from the film industry here with us. Um, so let me know if you guys can can see this, um, and then I can kind of walk through and tell you what's here. Yeah, so I'm if I, if I have my bearings right, I'm looking at the Amazon Nimble Studio console here in the uh, here in like the AWS console, right? Yep. Yeah. So this is it. Like this is, and this is actually really exciting because you know this is this is fairly new for us. Um, we just we just released uh, on the 28th, so um, this is kind of hot off the press. But you know what, what's been really exciting for me as as a product manager is I get to come in here now and I can actually star you know, Nimble Studio and see that in, in search for that within the services, you know, before it was all internal. And so, you know, now that it's out in the public, you know, you can come into to AWS and search for, for Nimble Studio and, and have access to it. And, you know, just like any entry point for any other service within AWS, uh, it starts in the console. This is where the customer comes, they, they see this, you know, kind of login and, um, you know, the fact that I already have a studio set up. So, um, you know, I can go to my studio manager um, and, and, you know, I'll walk you through kind of what we have here, but, but this is, we basically help onboard the customers. So we walk them through kind of an onboarding process to help them kind of get up to speed. And our goal really is to get a customer up and running and successful in creating content as quickly as we can. Um, so if I jump in, this is, this is the studio manager. This is, there's, there's kind of uh, a couple of personas that we are uh, addressing. Um, one is kind of this, you know, studio administrator where they're in charge of all the resources. They're in charge of what, you know, what render farm, what, what high speed storage they want, the machine types, those kind of things. Um, and, and then there's a different side, which is, is more the, the artist side. And this is, this is what the artists will see. So we, the artists are never actually in the AWS console. We have a Nimble Studio portal. Uh, this is the portal that the artist would log into. These would be the projects that an individual artist would have access to and the resources that they'd have access to. And so from here, the artist will go ahead and launch into, you know, their virtualized um, production environment, you know, which is really a, a virtual workstation and, and all the resources attached to it. Um, but just to kind of start you guys off, let, let's, let's talk a little bit about the first persona, which is the studio manager. And so that that is where the admin comes in. And, and if we take a look, um, th there's kind of this, these are the, the steps that you would run through when, when creating a studio. And um, you know, you, you'll set the kind of the name and region where that studio is located. Uh, we, we have a process called Studio Builder, which is a, um, a script that helps kind of orchestrate and, and really 
you can build uh, a nimble studio with resources you already have, but if you have no resources, Studio Builder will walk you through like, you know, how much disk space do you want? You know, what kind of uh, throughput do you want? What do you want to name your studio? That's, that's always the important thing. Like, what is the name of your studio? Um, what region? Um, you know, what kind of render farm? Do you want a Linux render farm? Uh, do you want a Windows-based render farm? Um, you know, so there's a bunch of kind of, you know, questions that we walk the user through a guided setup. And then we basically use that to deploy on the behalf of the customer all the resources into their account, and then we attach it to the Nimble Studio uh, service account uh, through our back end. Um, so if we take a look, um, you know, this is this is my studio. It's it's you know Nimble Studio three. This is my third one that I've been been creating with. Um, and if we take a look at the resources, these are the kind of resources that you can bring to the to the studio. So whether it's file storage, um, I can add additional storage. I can add a new compute farm, license server. So you know, one of the important things is that a lot of these softwares, um, you know, need licenses. And so uh, you can bring your own licenses. So if you've already have licenses that you've been using um, for your software, uh, you can repurpose those and bring those licenses and, and set up a license server and, and, and spin, up, uh, spin those off that, that server. Um, and of course, you can bring additional, you know, AMIs, uh, the uh, Amazon machine images, where, you know, for example, if you want a, a test uh, AMI for just kind of the latest and greatest software version of Maya, version of Nuke, you know, maybe Blender, however you want to do that, and, and then you all have your production-based uh, version uh, as well. These are the storages that I have. So I actually have a, a Linux home that's sitting on an EFS drive. Um, I have an FSX for Windows. Uh, I also have a Lustre. And so these are the resources that I have access to that I've built into my studio. If I wanna add more, um, I could go ahead through the process of you know, adding, adding additional storage and you know, I can choose the type of storage I want. Um, we also allow you to bring custom storages. So for something like Weka or Cumulo, um, you know, something that's an NFS-based or a Samba 3-based uh, storage solution, you can actually create and, and bring a custom storage solution on that. Um, so that, that's really um, you know, kind of the BYO approach. Um, you'll see I have a render farm. Um, I have a licensed server that we've kind of hijacked. Um, and then I've got my machine images. So here um, we provide two machine images out of the gate. Um, one is a Windows based and one is a, a Linux based. And, and really they're just a template. It's, it's more used to kind of just spin the studio up. It's got Blender on it. So you could quickly kind of test it out and do a POC and, and see if it's right for you. Um, but then what we expect is that most of all of our customers will then start to build their own AMIs and, and sit on top of that. Um, now, the, the cool thing that we've, we've added here, and this is kind of going more towards the persona of the studio admin, is, is the, what we call launch profiles. Um, and, you know, launch profiles are, are kind of a really a new construct that, um, for us that enables our customers to control the access to the infrastructure um, uh, to the artist. So, you know, rather than traditional kind of IAM, you know, um, roles and policies, um, we have this thing that basically controls who has access to what resources, and then you can share those uh, with another user. Um, so for example, if we take a look at just the default one, um, we'll go ahead and edit that. Um, this determines... I think we may, uh, Corbin may have been hitting a little bit of a lag spike here. We'll hang on. Yeah, no, chat, don't worry, we're still here. Corbin's internet, just uh, having a little bit of a hiccup here. But Rob, uh, let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing while we're waiting for Corbin to reconnect. So yeah, everyone, everyone in chat, the, the demo gods, fingers and toes crossed, please. Um, what I'm really excited about here is it seemed like when he was on the studio resources page here in the console, you could see effectively every single parameter that you want to modify for your studio, right? So you say, hey, want to scale out your storage for you know where you're putting your outputs for your rendering? You can do that right here. You want to uh, be able to attach a different server farm? All right, well, we are uh, experiencing some technical difficulties here, unfortunately, let's see, as we move all of these things across. But um, yeah, our, our overlays are, are slightly off uh, right now. We're waiting for Corbin to reconnect in the meantime. I think this would also be a <laughs> good time to probably run the video that shows uh, Amazon Nimble Studio again. So while we're waiting for Corbin to come back, should take about two minutes. Uh, we're gonna run the uh, the the announcement video for Amazon Nimble Studio. So, oh, thank you for sticking around, chat. Uh, we have more demo coming in just a moment. So we'll see you soon.
Hey, everybody. Hey, Jack. Thanks for coming for Nick at the last minute. Of course. Nice to meet everybody. So, are you all okay if I dive right in? Let's go for it. Sounds good. Okay. First off, we need to share the animation for Shot 12 in just three days. But I know the team is still cranking on Shot 11, so... Got it. We have a great freelancer we can bring in. Mateo. We can get him on it right away, even though he's in New York. Okay, I can set up a workstation, get the software, but I need to make sure we have the right plugins. Right it's okay, right. Jack. We can get them up and running within the hour. I'll send a link. Okay, I'll start prepping the files. Previs, the storyboards, the latest cameras. Jack, we're good. The link will have everything he needs. Okay. Uh, next question. With Haley gone, who's going to finalize the fog in shot 12? It says here, Haley's in a cabin in Oregon all month, yep. so... I'm here. I'm going to dial up the fog to make it feel more volumetric. But Haley, how are you going to make the changes and render it in time? No worries, Jack. I can make the changes on my laptop and then resubmit it to the farm. We have plenty of render capacity. Near infinite, actually. Hey, Jack, uh, let's chat after the call, and I'll explain everything. Thanks. So, I guess this week isn't going to be as crazy as I thought. Spend more time creating. Amazon Nimble Studio by AWS. The fastest way to set up your content creation studio in the cloud. Built by creators for creators. Visual effects and 3D and 2D animation for film, episodic and commercial work. From storyboard sketch to final deliverable. With on-demand virtual workstations scalable file storage, render farm capacity, and the ability to collaborate remotely. All of this built on the most secure, extensive, and reliable global cloud infrastructure, AWS. All right, well, that was the, the video again for the announcement. Um, we're st we, we've, uh, we've heard that Corbin is currently doing the uh, uh, all he can to restart his internet. So chat, thank you so much for bearing with us on this. But um, I have some things that I want to see, and I will ask Corbin to uh, do us a favor and show us when he returns. Um, ooh, I think actually he might be back. He heard that I was going to ask him to do things, and he got scared. So let's see if Corbin can rejoin us here. Da, da, da. Magic of production. He's coming back in. Chad, if there's anything yes. that you want to see, get that in. But I think, oh, show goes on. We're back. We. Uh... Sorry about that, guys. Um, let me let me see if I can pull this back up. Yeah, no worries. Uh, me... Chat missed you, Corbin. You were you were a real star. They're they're excited <laughs> to see more. Sorry about that. Um... Bring this back up and get this going. Yeah, no problem. We were just talking a little bit about how uh, cool it was to see all of the different aspects that you could scale out with the studio. So things like storage and um, you know, the compute farm and just having that all in one place. You know, Again, I could imagine a world where I could go into the EC2 console and then manage some of that or go into IAM and create profiles. But um, from what you've shown us so far, uh, it's been really nice to see that all of these are really scoped to the use cases directly in the Nimble Studio console without needing to you know, go off and learn some of the, the other constituent tools that may power them. Yeah, and uh, yeah, sorry, sorry about that hiccup. Um, you know, the cool thing about this is that, you know, my instance is actually still up and running. So even though my internet connection went down, um, you know, my, my machine, like, so this is my, my virtual machine, like that, that's still up on AWS. So I didn't lose anything from a data standpoint, or I didn't lose anything from, you know, something I was working on. I lost a little bit of time because, you know, I had to reboot my machine um, here at home, but that's just a laptop. Um, so, um, but yeah, so w where was I? Like <laughs> yeah, so when it, whenever you get the chance, reshare your screen, but we were just at the point where you were walking through, um, I believe it was the launch profiles for new yeah. people that would be onboarded and chat before the the tinfoil hats come out no this is not an elaborate ruse the corbin disconnecting is not to show <laughs> the value of of you know cloud computing to save our work and our progress i promise it's not scripted um yes trust <laughs> but, me i would not script that <laughs> <laughs> anyway yeah corbin um, whenever wherever you're picking back up on here so 
launch profiles. Um, yeah, so this basically defined who has access to what. Um, and so, you know, if we take a look at these launch profiles, I have, I have these launch profiles here. Um, and if I log in as an artist, um, I'll see those same launch profiles. So as I come in and, and say like, you know, let's, uh, let's create it one and I'm just gonna create one off of off the default one. Um, and I'll just copy that. And we'll just call this uh, live because um, that's what we're doing. And this is where I have the choice, right? So as a studio administrator, I can decide, okay, this is gonna be a freelance uh, launch profile. This is what I'm gonna share with some of my freelancers. I'm gonna give them access to the FSX for Windows. I'm gonna give them access to the render farm. Uh, we have access to Active Directory. So we have two kind of identity models on Nimble Studio. One is through SSO and that's the web identity that the users use to log in. Uh, and, and they never actually see the AWS console. Then of course, we also work with Active Directory because we, we need access and control over the workstation and the storage. Um, and so those two then talk to each other and that's how you have both an Active Directory which, which drives the users um, and then an SSO identity which, which allows them to log in um, through SSO. Um, you know, and I can come in here and, and control my, my uh, subnets, my VPC and, and, and all that uh, uh, basically says what resources I'm going to share with these artists. And so if you take a look here, for example, I'm gonna say this artist is gonna have access to basically the 4XL, the 8XL and the 16XL and the 12XL. So we're gonna leave the two smaller machines off because this may be a beefy uh, task that we're gonna give to an artist. Um, and then we're gonna go ahead and just create that new launch profile. And so if I come back over here, if as an artist I was logging in, logging in um, I would see that this launch profile is now being built uh, and it should be ready here in a second. But the way you onboard an artist is actually very simple. So if I have a freelancer that I wanna bring on board and I don't wanna have to ship them like we talked earlier, you know, that terabyte of data, make sure they have the right software in the machine. I basically come up in my admin role, I come up to my launch profiles and say, you know what, I'm gonna share this new, uh, this one's being worked on. So when that one's done, we'll share that. But basically I can come in here and say, you know what, I'm gonna share this resource with Corbin and Robin, and I'm just gonna share those resources with them, save the changes, and now they have access to those resources. Um, so the, the uh, let's go back to the, the support one here. Maybe I wanna add, uh, share that with Corbin. So now Corbin has access to that particular one. Um, and then when Corbin logs in or Jason logs in or whoever, um, they then have access to those particular launch profiles. So that one that we just created live is now ready and I could come in here and choose the machine type that I wanna use. So for example, if this task is gonna require a bunch of simulation, I wanna launch on a 16XL large, great. I'm gonna set it up there. I'm gonna choose the software. If I wanna launch Linux, if I wanna watch Windows, uh, I'll go ahead and do that. And then the really cool part is I can just define whether or not I wanna launch through a browser. So I can actually, you know, like if I'm sitting on a laptop at Starbucks and I don't have my, you know, my big desktop widescreen monitor, you know, I could stream this through the browser and just check on something. And then I can turn around and say, you know, when I get home, maybe at home, I've got fiber set up. I've got a nice Wacom tablet. I've got my widescreen monitor, you know, or at work, I also have my dual screen monitors. Um, so it really depends on, on the, um, the, the task at hand. And so if I'm at home, I'm going to use the native client and I'll go ahead and launch that. And then basically that goes ahead and launches a virtual workstation, which you can see here. Um, so this is my actual virtual workstation. This is a, a G4 instance. Um, that I'm working with and I have access to, you know, of course, all the software and, and things that I'm doing on that. So if I want to bring up something like in Blender um, and I can start, you know, moving some, um, you know, files around and start working within Blender. Um, these are just some files. Uh, these are some Blender files that, you know, you can go down, download from um, blender.org uh, just as kind of some test examples, but it's just to kind of give you an idea of, of what we're working on. But um, let me jump back real quick here. So let's go back to this live one. And if I want to go back in and just share this with a freelancer, again, I go back into my launch profiles, this live one is ready. And I say, you know what, Robin is this freelancer outside of, of, I don't know why I keep picking Idaho. It could be, you know, Oregon, it could be, you know, Nevada, it doesn't matter. Uh, but, you know, we're going to basically assign this to Robin. Uh, we're going to share that resource with them uh, and say those changes. And so now Robin has access to whatever that launch profile is providing access to. And again, those are the two personas. There's the studio admin persona, which is controlling all the resources. And then they share those resources through the launch profile with the artist. And then the artist logs in and they have access to only the resources uh, that the studio wants to provide them access with. 
Um, so that's another part of that kind of security change. You know, I may set up a, like for a freelancer that's not part of the core production, I may set up a completely different storage um, and have them work on a different storage that's outside and not even connected to the actual production. And then I just move that data over when they're done. Um, so it's, you know, there's, there's areas of separation and it's really depending on the studio and how, um, how they want to lay out that level of security. This is this is fascinating, yeah, and and this. people in chat are uh, raving about the. Oh, I'll just stop talking. You're showing more stuff. This is. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, you know, and I think part of what what we were talking about is just the access to the the hardware and, and the G4s, and you know, this is just a Blender scene that that you know I'm kind of playing back in real time. Um, you know, but th this is not just a playback of a movie. Like you know, this is this is a character that you know you can begin to then you know, move up on and, and make some changes on if I want to start moving the backpack around or, you know, whatever that might be. Um, and again, these are just demo files. Like this isn't something that, you know, I built or anything like that. There's some really talented artists, especially on the Blender side that that have uh, given these files out to the Blender community to kind of test and, and really see where the power is. And so this is a really cool one. I just love the look of this. Like this is a 3D environment, but it's just this 2D kind of look. And so you know, again, we don't care the type of content, whether that content is 2D, whether that content is 3D, um, you know, it really doesn't matter. And so, you know, whether I'm, I'm kind of like looking at this in a, in a different environment, you know, with different looks, uh, look and feels like we, we don't want to control that. That's up to the artist and, and how they want to create that. But you can see like, this is kind of what it looks like without kind of all the bells and whistles. And then you start getting into like, wow, like this, this is something I'd watch on a Saturday morning, right? Like I'd get up and have my coffee and my big bowl of, you know, Fruit Loops and I'd, I'd watch this show. Um, it's really cool. Um, this one uh, it just blows me away. Like this, this is this kind of, you know, very sculpted uh, uh, character, you know, this Fox kind of character, mythical characters. But, you know, the cool thing is, is like all of this is just live. You know, you can come in here and, and, and start to work with like, you know, if you take a look at those eyes, it's like whether or not you want this kind of blacked out eyes, you know, or you want to have kind of this, you know, whether this is a mythical creature or things like that, you can, you can come in here and just dial that in. And again, I'm not doing anything in particular other than, you know, playing with kind of some of these demo files, but um, this was just kind of a cool file. I can bump up the glow here so I can start to add a lot of glow, um, you know, come up here and we'll just really kind of blow that out a little bit. But again, this is all interactive, right? Like I'm not, I'm not having to compute this. This is the power of the G4s and, and sitting on a, a piece of software that takes advantage of that. So um, it, it's really cool. Um, but again, like this, if I if I kind of go more to the the you know, and I'm I'm a Linux guy more than I am a Linux uh, Windows guy, but but I'm basically this is my storage. This is my FX uh, FSX share that I've used uh, that I've added onto um, onto my workstation. And what those launch profiles do is basically those execute. We spin up the G4 workstation. We look at the launch profile and all the resources that are needed, and then we mount all that to the virtual workstation um, through the service account. And then they have access to you know whatever that storage is. Uh, this well, is you mentioned earlier that uh, for this remote workflow uh, arrangement, you could have somebody, let's say an artist, um, hooking up their Wacom tablet. How does that work? Is that gonna? Are you saying that this virtual instance here can connect? to some sort of local USB pass-through and I can have a Wacom tablet connected? Yeah, so we rely on DCV uh, as our streaming protocol, um, which is great. Um, they, they, they are a very fast uh, protocol that supports hotkeys and uh, USB inputs and things like that. And so we support Wacom tablets. Um, you know, a lot of our artists are very particular about uh, that kind of, um, you know, workflow. They, they use tablets all the time. And so that was a key part of, you know, our decision um, uh, in, when we were looking at kind of, um, you know, protocols to use and, and DCV fit that bill really nicely. Um, and so, you know, what, what, when you start talking about Wacom tablets and drawing, you, you, you always are going to get into the conversation of like, you know, is this performant? And to be honest, I don't know how this comes across in terms of streaming because, you know, I'm streaming this to myself and then I'm streaming this to you through Zoom and it's like this, you know, kind of back and forth. But for me, this is very performant. And, um, you know, the latency um, is, is very low here. And, and what we suggest is that, you know, typically uh, workloads that require a lot of kind of drawing and, and that kind of, you know, sub millisecond kind of uh, need, uh, you, you want to be in the, the 20 milliseconds or below in terms of latency. Um, and I kind of equate this to, you know, and I, I've told a story in the past where, 
um, you know, remember when the iPad first came out and, and you would sit there with the iPad and you had these drawing programs and you could get a little nubby pencil and you could draw and you could, you could make a circle real quick and you'd see the cursor follow you that circle behind, you know, that's the latency. That's, that's that kind of that split second millisecond change of like, when I draw the stroke of, a, of a drawing uh, curve, that following it. And, you know, and over time now that the iPad has the pencil and that latency is very low, but there was a lot of artists that just couldn't handle it. It's like, I, I don't want to deal with this latency, but there was other artists that really were said, you know what, this is great. I now have this little iPad that I can now draw amazing artwork. And they were able to create amazing artwork with that. And so latency, you know, people ask like, well, like what is the latency number that you have to get? And it's very dependent on the task you know, whether I'm doing drawing or animation, like if I'm doing rendering and compositing, I don't really need to have as high uh, or as low as latency. But if I'm doing drawing or editing or things like that, you want as low latency as possible. Um, and it's one of the reasons why specifically we're supporting LAX, which is the local zone, because we want the compute power and the storage to be as close to possible uh, to the artists so that they're not having to go up to a PDX. Um, so the local zone support is really important for a lot of our LA customers where they want to have that kind of sub millisecond uh, connection to uh, not, not only the storage, but also the workstations so that, you know, they can do their editing, they can do their drawing, storyboarding, those kind of things. Oh man, local zone today, outpost tomorrow? <laughs> It'd be, well, yeah, we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, this is really interesting. Um, again, for folks that are not familiar, uh, in, in our global network topology, we have regions at sort of the, the largest scale, and then we break those down into uh, availability zones and individual data centers below that, even if those are not directly accessible. And, you know, there are just certain times where those regions, customer workloads require even lower latency. And I think the experience here is really like ensuring that people are not really perceiving the latency or it's so low that they don't perceive that they have like a lag that breaks the disillusionment for them, right? In the same way that you described like early versions of, of drawing tablets. And so uh, LAX being one of the local zones on its own region in its entirety, but you know, really understanding where your customers are and making that a priority on launch to be able to deploy this there to serve those customers. It's a really interesting and unique story um, that, you know, I, I can't say I've heard from other, other services and launches. So, um, if you're in, if you're in LA, you can get, I'd, I'd venture a guess under that 20 milliseconds latency round trip, um, with, uh, you know, depending on where you are and as long as you have a stable internet connection, right? Yeah. It, it, it's funny because now, you know, we, one of our, one of the, the, uh, studios that kind of first adopted cloud technology untold studios, we, we went and visited them after we got acquired. And part of that is we wanted to kind of learn from some of their, the, the success that they've had. And we went and took a look at their machine room and it was basically an empty rack with, you know, a couple connections for the internet. And that, and that was it, right? Like it was, you know, and that the internet does become your kind of core infrastructure that you need to make sure you have. So I have fiber at home, you know, but you don't need fiber, right? Like you can do this with, um, you know, we, we suggest, um, you know, 20 megabits down um, is, is what you can do. Um, and again, it's very, it's going to be very dependent on that task. Um, so if you're in LAX and you can connect to the LAX local zone, um, you know, you're going to be in the sub five millisecond, four millisecond, like, which is awesome. Um, that, that's basically like having the computer right under your desk, right? Um, and even, you know, artists that are like, I'm streaming this out of PDX and I'm down in the Bay Area. So, you know, I'm a couple hundred miles away and I'm having access to this. And so, you know, the reach of all the different regions in the zones, you know, and, and availability zones um, makes a huge difference for, for our customers that want to have those remote workforces. And so that's, it, it's, it's going to change things. It's going to change things, probably the understatement of the episode, I'd say. You know, this, uh, from, again, like, in the same way to startups, uh, cloud computing and on-demand pricing enabled companies to pay only for what they need, and that enabled so many, so much exciting innovation and, and sort of uh, small groups of people to be enabled. I, I see this here with the with uh, with ours as well, and, and from everything that you've at least described, this sounds like more than just an incremental improvement. This is really a transformational shift. And in traditional software, I know we talk about terms nowadays like cloud native. If you had the choice, can to architect an application from the ground up or to transform an existing stack, uh, would you do so in a cloud native way that can tap into all of the value here? And 
really what it sounds like to me is 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 if visual effects artists are not in the business of racking and stacking hardware and building uh, the tools so that they can then ultimately make the art that they want to make. They just want to make the art. And, and what I've seen, what I think a lot of people in chat have seen is an ability to use the tools that feel good in the hand that, that they know and love, like Blender or, or uh, Adobe Suite or, or whatever that you can load onto an Amazon, you know, an AMI. Um, and you as a studio manager or an artist can just provision these virtual workstations backed by GPUs with low latency and the ability to add on and deliver these rendering workloads to render farms in an easy to use way. Like th this is not just about like, hey, could you have used AWS EC2 to do either a workstation or a render farm previously? But this is, even to someone like me, I could tie all of this together and start rendering and making changes to this. And I know nothing about vir visual effects end to end here. Uh, you know, even though I could string together some EC2 instances, um, this, this really just like, I, I think if I had to talk, think about it, the, the, the real word here is like, this is slick. It is, it is things were possible before, but this is just a game changer in, in terms of like how actionable this is as a tool to provide value for the people that would be using this. And again, lots of folks in chat um, saying some similar sentiments. Right, that, that's exciting to hear. Like for us, this is day one, right? Like this is our, you know, release of the product and, and it's only gonna get better. And, and, and I'm actually excited to see kind of, you know, what happens in the next five years? Cause when I look out five years, it's like, you know, I imagine that all of these different studios that have built on top of, of Nimble Studio are gonna be vastly different. The way they approach the projects, the way they approach their pipeline and their workflows, they're all gonna be different. But the thing that's gonna be the same is that they're sitting on top of an infrastructure that sits on top of AWS um, through Nimble Studio. And so, you know, like I'm running this on, I, I'm, I have access to this, you know, 16 XL large, you know, G, G4 uh, workstation. And I'm running this on my Surface laptop. Right, like I just got this little teeny laptop, and I got a you know a nice widescreen monitor, but um, but I don't have that kind of horsepower at home, right? Like I don't I don't have that. I just have a laptop, so um, it's it's exciting to see what our customers are going to do with this. Wonderful. Um, I'm I'm gonna you know I think close it, Rob, unless you have any other closing sentiments here. I think uh, this would not be possible if. In my opinion, if you were not creators yourselves, you know, it's it's one thing to look at a, a spec sheet of a, of a service or a software solution and uh, think about whether that checks the boxes for an individual. But what's really apparent to me here, and, and, and you know, me this echoes some of the stories you told before about how the Nimble uh, team sort of assembled, is you built the tools that you wish you had and, and you know, expertise from across the industry. Yeah. And, like, it's that love and care and awareness of, what other colleagues would want to use that I think enables uh, a solution like this to be possible, right? If if you just had to describe the features something needed, it wouldn't nearly be as 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 seamless of an experience as this. And I think that that really means a lot, especially in terms of what you're probably going to be making into the future with features. Yeah, we're you know we're a service that was created by a bunch of creators, um, you know, and both of that is from a technician standpoint, from an artist standpoint, you know, we were all creators. We all kind of came from this industry, and so, um, you know, we, we we saw a need, and and AWS saw that, and and you know, the rest is history, and we were able to kind of, you know, bring that to fruition, and so we're excited about it. Yeah, I, I think you are bringing up a good point, Corbin almost without exception, the best software that I've used, the best content that I've consumed, it's from people who are really passionate about the space. And usually that comes from a point of solving your own problems. Yeah. Um, or in the case of, you know, building games, it's, it's somebody building a game that they wish existed, that they themselves want to play. Yeah. And it's very clear that this is coming from the heart here. This is something that you guys wish had existed at the time. It's a, it's a pain point. And, uh, you know, you rolled up your sleeves and solved it. So I, I love seeing this kind of project. The, the other interesting thing is, you know, this strikes me as one of those projects where if you if you break it down into its components and, and maybe excuse the terminology here, it's almost like, yeah, this could work. Somebody could see how these, these pieces fit together, right? It's a, it's a great um, assemblage of all the different building blocks out there. But that's what innovation sometimes takes the form in, okay. assembling the pieces that are available because technology is moving constantly and no, it's extremely difficult to figure out all the different permutations of pieces that will work or will not work. Um, the thing that really comes to mind is uh, VR, right? When, when, um, uh, when Lucky Palmer, for example, started off with uh, Oculus. Yeah. What made that possible at the time? That was all due to the innovation of mo mobile hardware, right? Mobile yeah. screens and uh, low latency mobile 
screens that had high enough pixel density to put really up close to your face and not have a screen door effect. Who would yeah. have thought to do that? Right. Yeah. So, but, but the point is that 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 I think I think industry in the industry all too often we we look for these like flash flashbang innovations like oh my god I can't believe that exists it's like you know a quantum computer or something but often it's not that it's, it's small incremental steps ten percent better here ten percent better here add them together and the sum the the product is, is greater than the, the sum of, of the parts so uh, that's what I'm seeing here today uh, I think we've you know Nick and I have have um, I think we've been pretty forthcoming that, that we're excited about the product and we're excited to see what it is going to enable. But I just feel like this itself is one of these connective pieces, right? It's it's connecting all these blocks to create something that is, is greater than the sum of the parts. And then it itself is going to be a building block into the new media ecosystem, into tapping into global talent, into tapping into remote workflows. I love it. it, it it's funny, the point you just made, I, I really like because you know, we are a service that actually sits on a bunch of other AWS services, right? Like we're not just, we're, we're not just a standalone, you know, service like S3 or, you know, EC2 or something like that. Like we're, we're a bunch of services that, you know, SSO, S, you know, FSX, you know, all of this, uh, you know, EC2, we, we bring it all together. So we're kind of this one layer. There's the, there's the underneath layer of all the other services that we sit on top of and, and orchestrate. Then there's the nimble service the Nimble Studio service. And then kind of what you brought in is like, there's going to be all these customers that then build on top of that as well. And so there's this kind of layered effect, you know, back to the Shrek days of like, you know, onions and layers. And, you know, it's, it's kind of one of these things that it's, it's really cool to see. And so I, I, I'm happy to hear you guys are excited about this because, that you know, we, we, we have a huge talented uh, group of engineers that kind of, you know, especially has been working really hard over the last little while and, and both from the marketing side, the PR side, you know, especially the engineering side, they've, they've really put, you know, blood, sweat and tears into this. And, and so it's exciting to get this out into the hands of customers. I can't, I can't wait. Wonderful. Um, I, I could see you, I could watch you walk through these blender tutorials all day, <laughs> but unfortunately we uh, do have, uh, we are coming up at time. Corbin, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, just hot off the press is the launch of Amazon Nimble Studio and taking the time to come down here and chat with us. Uh, thank you again from, from myself and Rob. Thank you from chat. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And uh, I certainly would have not made it this far if I were to be diving in myself. So the, the walkthrough and the demo was, was immensely uh, helpful. And I know a lot of folks in chat are looking forward to using the service. Yeah, Rob, Nick, I, I appreciate the time you guys gave us. It, it was awesome to be able to kind of show this off to you guys. And, and it's fun hearing you guys talk about it. So thank you. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Well, um, we are going to go to a quick holding screen just for a few moments. And then when we return, Rob and I will be back to close out the show. We'll be talking about when our next episode will be. So stick around, chat. We'll be right back. <laughs>